everyone. Um, very happy to see so many people here on a really warm day, and uh, that's really great that uh, market intelligence has, has gotten you away from the sun. Um, we usually start a couple minutes late because we know people get off at, at noon, so I'm sure there'll be a couple stragglers coming in, but I did want to get started. Um, my name is Carrie Damon. I work on educational programming at Mars, so if you've come to best practices before, you've seen me a lot. Um, I also work on Entrepreneurship 101, and I'm here to introduce my colleague, Usha uh, Srinivasan, who is the Director of Market Intelligence um, at Mars. So she'll actually speak a little bit towards the end of her presentation on um, what her team does. They do provide um, free services for entrepreneurs uh, startups of a certain size and, and revenue and investment level, um, which is really exciting. But this session is actually targeted more to um, also doing market intelligence on your own and, and what's important. So a couple words about um, Usha's background. So Usha's been with Mars two or three years? Two, two years. And prior to that, she worked for the global research firm Frost & Sullivan, which is the leading global um, market research and consulting company. Um, she led a team of analysts there and uh, consulted for companies of varying sizes. Her background is environmental um, and building technologies um, and water, which is her specialty. Um, she has a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from University of Bristol and a PhD in Environmental Sciences from the University of Aberté in Dundee, Scotland. So without further ado, I will uh, let Usha take over. And the session will usually go to about 1 o'clock or maybe a bit less for her lecture and we'll do questions after that. Okay, thanks very much for coming. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, again, I'm really pleased to see so many people on a warm day like this. Uh, you'd rather be sitting outside having lunch than listening to me uh, lecture here today. But I hope that in the next hour or so I would be able to share with you some of the insights that I have learned over the years uh, working in a as a scientist as well as a, as a consultant in the company Frost & Sullivan that uh, Sherry, uh, Carrie mentioned. Um, just want to poll the audience before we get started to see how many entrepreneurs we have in the audience. Um, so a show of hands, entrepreneurs in the audience. Okay. How many closet entrepreneurs in the audience? <laughs> there you go, more hands up. <laughs> Uh, who, who would like to be entrepreneurs. So you're obviously here because of some attraction to this topic um, and want to learn uh, about how, we, how to use this to your advantage. So uh, let's get started. So the first thing that I want to tackle with is the definition of what uh, market intelligence means. And uh, when I use the word market, I'm using it loosely. I'm also referring to um, competitor intelligence, industry intelligence, and uh, competitive intelligence, all of this put together. So if you were going to do market intelligence, the P&G style, the Procter & Gamble style, it might be anywhere from dumpster diving to uh, the uh, military intelligence. Um, uh, I used to work in Cincinnati in Ohio, which is the headquarters for PNG, and you often often hear people talk about, oh my God, those guys, they would do anything to get a competitive edge over another company. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you do any of that as part of your uh, market intelligence, but I w strongly recommend reading the book Soap Opera, which is a, a great read uh, for anyone who's in the industry or not, just to get a sense of what it means to, to be uh, ahead in the game. Um, but for a minute, let's consider that um, what market intelligence is everything that you need to know about a particular product before you make that purchasing, purchasing decision. Okay, just let it sit with you at the moment, okay? You are making a decision to buy something, maybe you made a recent purchase, and what are the different things that you think about before you make that purchase, okay? So ask yourself the question, are you a savvy buyer? Um, so what do you consider before you buy a product? Um, let's pre pretend that we're buying a flat screen TV. Okay, first thing that you think about, what brand am I going to buy? Am I going to buy LG, Sharp, or something else? Uh, what um, model would it be? Uh, then you're going to see if there are any product differentiators. There is a warranty or other services that you like. Uh, maybe you're a, you have a design preference, maybe a particular size, um, et cetera, that's appealing to you. Price would be an important thing for you to consider. Obviously, you want, you want to spend 800 or 500. You're going to think about that. Um, you're going to ask others who've bought similar brands, maybe among your family, you know, 
friends uh, who have bought it. Maybe they have some comments on what they like and don't like, so customer voice. And last but not least, you're going to think about, am I going to go to Best Buy or Future Shop or just go online? So all of these decision points are being made when you buy something, uh, uh, buy a product. You're making conscious decisions about it. Um, however, when the table turns and you are the one selling and you are looking at a customer buying your product, um, perhaps that level of uh, you know, expectation that they will be asking all of these questions sometimes fails. <laughs> Um, we can't have the attitude of, I'm going to build it, it's going to be excellent, and people will buy it, no questions asked. Um, we can't live in that kind of scenario. Um, and in that regard, I want, to ask your, uh, I want you to ask yourself, sometimes do you think, as an entrepreneur, um, you are your own obstacle um, in this space? Um, so, we worked with almost 800 entrepreneurs uh, this past year, and we love them all equally. I have two children. I know how that works. I, we love them all equally. And uh, their enthusiasm and the passion for their technology is really infectious. Um, but sometimes um, they, are, they have their quirk, quirkiness, and uh, they have certain attributes that make it hard for us to work with them. <laughs> Uh, myself included, I'm including myself in this category. So humor me for a second and see if you recognize yourself in one of these attributes that I, I'm going to put out. Uh, do, you, do you think of yourself as a jack of all trades? Do you want to be the, the CEO, the CTO, the CFO, and the CMO? Uh, maybe in some cases when you're just starting out, that's all you can do, but uh, be open to getting help from others. Um, I belong in this category <laughs> because as an entrepreneur uh, from the academic space, I was more concerned about publishing. I didn't care to hear about anything to do with patenting or any such nonsense. Um, so I belong in that category. Maybe you are, you are too. Um, others are a little impatient. Uh, they just want to get the money, the feel the money. Getting the money will solve the problem in getting ahead. Um, Maybe you have a certain amount of emotional attachment to what you're working with, and, and all of us do as entrepreneurs do. Um, and sometimes you want to, you're such a perfectionist, you want to get it to a level that will be the, so, you know, the, the best thing out, not the prototype B that you are less satisfied with, uh, that the time to market may be lost. So maybe you are in that category. Um, the other couple of things, you know, uh, balancing listening to everyone versus not being open to advice, balancing that out, you know, being open is good, but at the same time, you are the boss of your company. Make that decision on your own. So, did anyone recognize yourself in this, any of these categories? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. <laughs> there. <laughs> There's a couple more hands there. Um, so, Despite all of this, um, I would say the creativity, the innovation, enthusiasm that entrepreneurs uh, bring prevails uh, hands down. And that's why it's exciting for us to be working in this, uh, uh, in this uh, organization. I get pleasure out of working with these entrepreneurs with these cool ideas day in and day out. And so does some of my team members that are, who are here uh, in, the, in the audience. Um, so let's go on a journey together. I want you all to think about a product or your technology that you are thinking about commercializing. It doesn't make sense for me to go through the exercise if you are not actively participating with me. So think about it. So let's go. The first thing is you've obviously identified a particular pain in the industry. Obviously, that's bread, not pain, but you know, for those of you who are French speaking. Um, and you know that there is a need in that space and you're going to try to fill it. Okay, what's next? Is it worth to solve? Uh, so you're going to contemplate, am I going to be spending $100 to sell something for a dollar? You're thinking about the economics of it, obviously. Um, how important is it to finding the solution? Um, is it a fad or is it something priority in that space that can be sustained? You're thinking about that. Um, the next is probably you're thinking about, you know, how competitive am I going to be? Am I going to be so disruptive or am I playing with a lot of other players in the market space? So you're, you have to examine that. Um, so what next? 
Um, and I think when you have met with any kind of business advisors who have helped you uh, at Mars or el elsewhere, they probably have told you the key to success is market strategy. But is that something easy that is instantaneous? People understand it as it's such a complex issue that um, getting your head around it can be hard. Um, to illustrate why it's hard, um, I'm going to take a very simple example. We have audience, audience here from various backgrounds, from ICT, Life Sciences, Clean Tech. So I've chosen a product that is simple that everybody can understand. So everybody knows what this is. It's a drinking water treatment system. Uh, so you have uh, a product that can go on uh, the, the tap or under the sink, or it could be uh, at the entry point in a home, a point of entry system. But did you know that this is one of the most complex products out there in terms of the customers, the players, the pricing points, the business models, the distribution channels? It is so complex. This is a $7 billion market globally. Did you know that? It's as big as that. So let's go through why it's complex. So first thing, uh, customers, local and global. Um, it, this is obvious, you know, the water quality is not the same in every country. So what you would use here in North America is not the same somewhere in Asia. So the products have to match the region that you're uh, selling it to. Uh, second, competitors. There are over a thousand competitors in this space. Um, and a few leading ones. You might recognize a few names like Brita or GE uh, or Culligan, but there are a few other names there which may not be so obvious. Um, everyone her has heard the name Amway before at some point in their life. Did you know that this company has almost a billion dollars uh, market share in this space, but they don't sell, do you see, see them sell in the retail <laughs> store or any other obvious place that you've seen? No, because their business model is very different, and we'll come to that. Um, there's Wujin Kowei, which is a, a Korean company, which is a lead uh, provider of um, uh, residential water treatment system in, in Asia. So there's a lot of hidden players. If anyone came to us with an idea for a residential water treatment product, I would be quite um, <laughs> negative about trying to make them you know, up, get into this space because it's very highly competitive already. Um, the distribution channels in this space, you, you've experienced it yourself. You can buy Brita products in a, uh, in a uh, uh, retail store versus there are distributors, there's water depots, you can buy them online. There's all kinds of ways that this product is sold. And um, thinking about pricing models and business models, um, the reason things are so complex in this space is, for example, Amway sells it through multi-level marketing. Um, they, this is the, this, their product, which almost costs $800, mm -hmm. is sold through their channel members. And they get very high points for selling that product. So they're incentivized by points to, to have this product be sold and therefore an easier sale. Um, I don't think I would spend $800 on my own to buy a water treatment system for my home uh, if I wasn't in incentivized in some ways. Um, there are other really quirky models, uh, like Wujin Kowei that I mentioned in Korea, um, has a rental model. They have a huge store where people can come and use the products. Um, they even rent toilet seats, which is very strange, but they do, um, which are you know, the, the Japanese toilet seats that you may have heard of, which have all kinds of controls. So they rent, rent those, <laughs> including the water treatment systems. Um, so they have very strange models that works in other countries and maybe not here. So just to get the point across that even a simple product like this has such a complex universe of things to think about. Um, so in your own industry, in your own universe, just think about um, what, what are the challenges that you might, be, uh, uh, that you might come across. Um, but hopefully today we will tackle um, how you could use industry knowledge, market intelligence, customer knowledge to your advantage uh, to get to all of the strategic points that you want to, uh, to understand who you're competing with, uh, the technologies or the companies, um, how big is the market size that you're going after, um, which geographies are you going to sell into, uh, sorry, where, where are you going to sell into, 
Um, how are you going to uh, sell? You know, the business models or pricing models you can take into consideration, and uh, obviously which industries. So let's tackle each one, and uh, uh, I will hopefully share some insights with you on those. Okay, the first one. Who am I competing with? Um, I think this is a really cool little tiny camera. I don't know about pri privacy issues, but um, it is a very cool tiny camera here <laughs> that I, I have here. Um, so what are the questions that you might be asking? Uh, you're asking the question, yes, is my technology disruptive? Uh, who are my direct competitors uh, at the price point that I'm in? Um, I want to stress that uh, when you're asking the question about direct competition, you need to be sure that, um, you know, of course, maybe you're in a medical device and you have a product um, that you know, is competitive with a GE product or some other um, Japanese company product, but maybe you're replacing only a tier three smaller company product at this time. So be very conscious about what space your, what uh, company you're comparing yourself to. Um, and does your competitor have a diversified portfolio uh, compared to yours? I mean, uh, so look at how you are, you are placed with them. Um, so how could you find some of these answers? Um, and I, I'm going to give tips on some of the databases that we internally use to find some of that information. Um, I'd be happy to share. Uh, any thoughts on how we could help you in, the, in, in finding some of this information as we go along. So in terms of patent searching, I'm sure there are people in this audience, and I, can, I recognize some of them who know patent searching better than I do. Um, but there are public databases like the USPTO, US uh, uh, Patent and Trademark Office, and the World uh, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Office, which are public databases where you can go and search for um, patents that are already published or prior art, art searches that you could do. Um, we do have access to certain paid databases that helps us to do this a little easier. Um, I had the opportunity to listen to a US, US patent um, lawyer recently, and the first opening sentence he said, you Canadians, if you're coming to the US, just be prepared to be sued. This is what he had to say. So with that said, I think regardless of where, uh, if you are going to go into US for business, that is something in a inevitable truth that it might happen. So you, you should get all your ducks in a row in terms of uh, patenting, et cetera, and get the right kind of support. Um, also understand your position in the value chain, meaning uh, are you selling to another business or are you selling directly to the customer? And you can get a feel for uh, your competitive landscape. That's important to know so that you know who you're comparing yourself to. Um, and then maybe do a very honest SWOT analysis. I'm sure pretty much everyone in this audience knows what a SWOT analysis is. Um, I have an example in the next slide. But uh, doing a very uh, comprehensive, uh, honest SWOT analysis is, can be very helpful. Um, and we can get to that. And say, for example, you are comparing, um, uh, let's say that you're beyond the technology stage and you're in a product stage. Um, I found, um, as a, as just a, as an analyst, walking around the floors of a trade show, you can get to know a lot about different products, just talking to the salespeople. So, um, I like to call it mystery shopping. You don't necessarily have to reveal who you are, but talking to the salespeople of different organizations or different members, you can understand what their gaps are, what their needs are. Um, not the most honest way to get information, but it can be helpful. Um, and you know, product brochures, et cetera, that you can pick up can be really uh, important tools. And people don't highlight things that they're not good at. So obviously good things are highlighted there. So it's good to talk to individuals to get a feel for it. Um, so how many of you in this audience has uh, done some kind of a SWOT analysis before for your company or your product or your technology? A few hands go up, very good. Um, so you know what this means. So uh, there are so many tools out there on the, on, um, online that you could use to do this. But my only recommendation is that uh, uh, our, our group can help you do this, but be very specific about what you want to do the uh, analysis on. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it essentially captures the strengths and weaknesses of your company. The top two, two boxes are internal uh, focused items, and the t bottom two are external focused items, are opportunities and threats that you might be facing. And obviously the ones uh, on the horizontal first are the favorable and the unfavorable uh, on the other side. 
Um, be very specific. Uh, do a, a one for each of the different segments that you want to look at. It could be just about financials or just about your product or just about your product distribution or even about personnel. So be very specific what you want to do the SWOT analysis for so you can get deep into what your uh, issues might be in the company. Um, so the next very ominous question that we often get and we try our best to help our entrepreneurs with is, what is the size of my market? Is it the planet or is it over here somewhere? Um, so what can you, what is your achievable, you know, your potential could be, yes, a larger space, but how can, what can you address in the next year, the two years, the three years, something that's, uh, in, that you can, you know, focus on. Um, I'm sure some of you have had experiences where you go to, uh, meeting with uh, investors where you throw out a very large number and they always get nervous uh, about how you got to that big number. Um, so uh, we often, uh, our advisors obviously coach them to, uh, to make sure that they are realistic in their expectations. Um, and you know, how, what share do you have uh, among that com competitor space? Um, like I said before, you, you have to compare yourself to specific uh, companies that are of your same size rather than larger organizations so that you don't get misled. Um, so s s what are some of the ways that you, we could help you or you could help yourself find that information? Um, there are, number one, um, there are numerous uh, market research reports out there from various companies for different industries. I'm sure you've seen them. Um, and uh, what I have to say about that is, it's only as good as the analysts that write them. So don't take it as gospel. Uh, compare various reports. Um, there are certain uh, companies that have more credible numbers than others. They have actually a proprietary methodology for the market sizing and forecasting. So uh, be careful about who you use as your, uh, as your reference point. Um, we can certainly help you identify the right sources uh, in that regard. Um, be clear about the definition that these uh, analysts are using. Are they using product plus services or is there any nuances there that you haven't realized? Most reports should have a definition section in the beginning of the report if they don't ask for it. Um, most companies are okay for you to contact them and say, I would like to speak to the analyst who wrote this report. So feel free to do that. You've bought it. You have the right to ask the question. Uh, and ask enough questions until you're satisfied that the methodology is sound. Um, we have helped many companies connect with analyst, analysts in that regard to, to get further uh, depth into certain uh, markets. Um, the other thing is, you know, don't be shy to try to do your market sizing on your own. Um, you have a reference point as a number and then try to do it on your own. And it can be tricky, whether it, depending on it's a publicly traded space versus a privately held uh, companies. Environment sector is notorious. The majority of the companies are privately held and it's very difficult to know what, how big these companies are. So I have two pointers for you for that. Um, one, if it's a publicly traded space and there are larger players and uh, they are publishing obviously annual reports, there's tax filings, uh, there's uh, all kinds of documents that they put out there that can be your clue. Um, you know, they might talk about a particular product being very well uh, sold in that space. So that those can be your clues to get a market size of uh, maybe, for example, GE. You know, you want to know what the GE healthcare and within GE healthcare something else, how big is that space um, uh, versus all of GE. So it can be tricky, but those documents can be very helpful. Um, and obviously, you have to put yourself in the tier three bucket where you're the big entrepreneur uh, just starting out. Um, in the privately held uh, companies as well, the same resources, again, can be helpful. Uh, press releases are really, uh, you know, can be in, 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 in informative uh, in terms of understanding where they are placed. They often want to showcase things that they are proud about, so they would put a press release. So you can, um, if they're doing very well in a particular product, you can you know, gauge uh, if they are doing well. And if you roughly know the price point of that product um, and, uh, and location of that organization, maybe you could uh, extrapolate the size of, of that particular, of the revenues of that company. Um, also when you're doing market sizing, um, 
please, please, please never put global numbers in papers without any reference points of, uh, of regional uh, aggregates that you've put together. One of the, some of the companies that we work with have very good uh, regional reports. Obviously, you know, uh, the competitors are different, the uh, nuances are different from country to country. It makes no sense to put a huge global number, uh, which really doesn't make any sense and I think puts off investors quite a bit. So try to find reports that are very specific about uh, with regional breakups. And uh, ultimately, of course, make realistic assumptions of um, how you want to, uh, how you size your, your uh, market. Moving on to the next one, um, next question. So you know your competitors, you know the size of the market that you're going after. Um, where am I going to sell uh, is the next question. Should I be selling in North America? May maybe your product is really not suited for this country. It's, maybe it's suited for some other uh, place in Asia. Uh, maybe that's where you, you should be selling. Um, Maybe there are gender preferences or cultural differences that you need to take into consideration before you sell into that space. Uh, very important, you need to know about the regulations or any kind of restrictions of, for that particular product. Uh, that's an important thing for you to understand before you go into a new space. Uh, and where do you need partnerships when you sell there? You know, there are countries, uh, certain countries like China and India, where you cannot sell in that market unless you have a local partner. It's very important. Um, you know, they can help you weave through the uh, different uh, nuances in those countries. Um, so think about all of those. And um, I have some suggestions here on where you could tap into some of those, uh, some of those resources uh, that can help you get there. So one, um, you can consult with reports that are out there that uh, cover customer behavior and preferences. Um, I've listed a few here. Um, but industry associations are a great resource. They often put out uh, free documents on you know, uh, preferences of a particular uh, sector. Um, like Carrie mentioned, I come from the water sector. So American Water Works Association does a poll of the municipalities. Uh, um, North, in North America all the time and publishes that information on their website and, um, and it, it can be very uh, in, um, you know uh, informative to know you know what wh where they're spending their money uh, at the current time what are their needs and uh, things that they're looking at um, so I would encourage you to look at industry association websites and of course uh, I cannot but, but I have to mention the social media um, that has taken over our uh, homes, lives, everything. <laughs> I recently was at a uh, cyber safety event at my um, uh, daughter's school, and I'm quite petrified actually after that uh, uh, that that talk about privacy issues and the kinds of things that goes on. Um, uh, thankfully, my children are not not old enough to have Facebook pay, uh, accounts, so I'm I'm grateful. But the time is coming. Um, but a lot of corporations are using social media in a very positive manner. Um, you can see, I think pretty much all large corporations, Coke and Pepsi and you know PNG and all of those companies have a Facebook, Twitter account. They're actively polling uh, their customers what they like, don't like, etc. Um, this particular example of PNG polling teenagers, I mean, you wouldn't get a peep out of teenagers about uh, hygiene products, but in Facebook, they were happy to talk about everything and anything and got a lot of wealth of information before they went into product design. So it can be helpful, but you know, be warned about the privacy issues. Be, when you're so open, you, know, you, you have to be careful about uh, how much your competitors might be also looking at your, your information sources and you know, what you are asking of your customers. Um, the other thing that can be very helpful to understand your, um, your, um, your customers is uh, very targeted focus groups. Uh, at Mars here, we had the opportunity to help an entrepreneur do a very focus, uh, a small focus group. Uh, this entrepreneur is in the, uh, in the software space, environmental health and safety software, but he wanted to build something in the, uh, for the multi-residential and commercial buildings related to greenhouse gas. It uh, <laughs> was not just greenhouse gas re reduction, but just uh, you know, how your uh, uh, footprint for the entire organization from carpet to anything, any decisions that is made can be measured. Um, we were very surprised that very top real estate 
owners in uh, Ontario uh, were very willing to come and participate in the focus group. We were not paying them, you know, incentivizing them in any way, shape or form, but they were happy to participate and give their uh, opinions because they wanted to see a product like that come out and uh, gave him feedback. Um, as a result, he was able to build something that was uh, you know, attractive to customers and he does have first customers as a result of it. So I think it's a, a very useful exercise. Um, not that uh, we, we've done it too many of these, it's just one that I, I can share. And I think you could explore an opportunity to try and do the same for your own um, organizations. Um, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, we were at the Discovery uh, 2010. I don't know if some of you have uh, had the opportunity to go to the OCE Discovery 2010 e event. There were a lot of people from uh, uh, Trade Commissioner's office there, uh, from uh, Brazil, Singapore, etc., and they were hungry to really know about, you know, who we're working with, the entrepreneurs we're working with, and see the synergy. So I think they're very open for entrepreneurs to contact the offices. And of course, it very much depends on how, um, and, and everybody here knows what DFAT is, because I had this question once before. Yes, everybody knows. <laughs> um, Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Um, depends on how active those individual offices are, the people in those offices are. Uh, but you know, even simple things that uh, one entrepreneur mentioned to me that has been very helpful to him is he asked his defate uh, person uh, to send just news clippings of things of a particular uh, industry that he was following because it wasn't online, it was a local newspaper, and he thought that it was very helpful to him to get that information from a defate person to make certain decisions that he was uh, uh, trying to. To, to you know, you can't travel there all the time to be there, but um, so you can uh, you can take advantage of it to understand your the space that you're selling into. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Very quiet. Um, so the next question is, how am I going to sell? Um, the very complex question of uh, you know what is my business model going to be? How am I going to price it, etc. Um, I have put some examples here and we will talk about that. Um, I have some fun examples, um, as you can see, <laughs> um, that uh, hopefully you'll think it's fun <laughs> as much as I have. Um, who has the most innovative business models? Um, maybe you could learn from other companies' best practices. You know, no shame in you know, copying <laughs> if it works for someone else and maybe it works for your industry. And cross-industry examples as well, and maybe not just in your industry. Um, you know, then thinking about, you know, how much I should price my product, uh, you know, what revenue model um, uh, should I, you know, think about, you know, single sale plus services or what is it, you know, should I white label or license, etc. Um, so before we go into a few of the tips of how you could get information, I wanted to share with you a few uh, nice business models that I have often heard people talk about and I love the Zipcar model and, and there's a um, I'm not sure if you knew that the Zipcar and the Apple, Apple um, sorry, the iPhone have connectivity now, which is really exciting. So let's talk about that first. So everybody knows about the business model of iPhone. I won't bore anybody with that. Um, but what's cool about it is when you think, you know, is there enough applications there? Well, there's one more that's specific to Zipcar um, that is really cool. Anybody does not know what Zipcar is, who they are? Everybody knows. No, sh don't be shy. If you don't know, you just put your hand up. I, I will explain it. <laughs> Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, so it's an alternative to renting the car from the traditional places like Enterprise, etc., where you have to return the car. A zip car. There are parking locations throughout the province um, or Canada. I think Canada, um, and you can you just have a zip car card where you just swipe or uh, swipe it and you, the keys are already in the car and you can pick it up and drop it off wherever you, you know, you're going from A to B, you don't have to return it. And it's like a club. But what's cool about it is the, the, the Apple application now, um, it'll help you locate a car in a parking lot near you as you're driving. Will help you to uh, uh, sound the horn of that car so you can locate where it's parked. 
um, will help you unlock the car so you can get in and drive. Uh, so there's just limitless possibilities of how people are using technology and innovative ideas. Um, I thought it was pretty exciting and, and cool. cool. Um, so there are so many applications that you can, you know, maybe not obviously relevant to your industry, but uh, perhaps it's something that inspires ideas in you. The other one that I often hear people talk about, and if you put the word Nespresso in, uh, in Google, you'll find lots of information about it. Um, this company apparently um, has been around for almost 30 years, but not very many people have heard about it. Um, and Mr. Clooney here was uh, hired in 2006 to be the spokesperson. Uh, you would never find him be in any advertisements in North America, but in Europe, he's you know it's considered cool uh, to be part of uh, advertising for Nespresso. Um, but this company doesn't sell in the obvious places. It doesn't sell in supermarkets. Um, you can only buy it online or become a club member. Uh, they provide you with pods of coffee. I mean, it's very common now. You see coffee pods everywhere in every office. But this was a revolutionary idea that they came up with almost 15 years ago. And every European household apparently has this, this product. And uh, you just become a club member and you get a pot of coffee. Uh, every, and, then, and they know their customers so well. This is a good example of how they've developed the product over 30 years, but only understanding their customers better, refining their, the, the product, refining the, how sleek the whole model is. So, I mean, customer preference is very, very uh, uh, important. I often hear some of our advisors say, customers drive market, especially digital media, um, you know, uh, it's not, you know, you build technologies because it's cool and somebody's going to buy it. It's the reverse. You're, you're driven by the customer preference. Um, so coming back to some of the points um, in terms of how to, uh, to use uh, the information around you for business models and pricing, of course, the focus groups that I mentioned before uh, could also be a way for you to determine pricing. I have actually uh, been part of certain business-to-business focus groups that I have seen uh, been very effective in determining price points. You could be way off of how, what a business would pay for your product, and it can be helpful to have uh, those kind of focus groups. Um, uh, and then, of course, giving a consideration to the geography of where you're selling. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether you want a white label or license, and this is an often a, a question of uh, preference or, you know, how if you're a smaller organization, um, you know, if you want a name recognition from another larger company to use that to your advantage to, to white label to them, or you want to license it so that you have ownership over, um, you know, how you're manufacturing a product, have quality control, etc. cetera. Uh, so it, each has its advantages and disadvantages. I think it would be, not, it would be um, helpful for you to look at other companies who are have in your own space or other space. You've tried different models and learned from their uh, mistakes or lessons learned kind of thing. Uh, I think that would be valuable. Um, I have had a few entrepreneurs ask me that, those questions. And, um, and I think the best thing to do is talk amongst yourselves, among entrepreneurs, to help uh, you understand some difficulties you might have uh, faced in different uh, spaces. Um, last but not least, which industry am I going to sell into? Am I uh, going to sell into the defense space or the healthcare space? It's quite possible. It might be applicable to both. Um, are there barriers to entry in certain verticals lower than others? Maybe uh, there's less reg regulations or they're price agnostic. Um, you know, less regulations can be a positive and a negative. Uh, sometimes, uh, I think in, in, in the U.S., uh, for environmental products, uh, a lot of companies actually sell to California first because they have the most stringent regulations, uh, even more than the federal regulations. So companies that have an approval for California have an easier time selling to other states. So it can be a positive. Um, other things like price agnostic, you know, uh, we have, have worked with a company before who were uh, might have, you know, they're developing a DNA, rapid DNA test for, um, uh, for a particular disease condition, but it's in the farm, farming space, you know, and an expensive DNA test to sell to a farmer might be harder for them to do than if they maybe want to sell it to, um, you know, um, uh, horse breeders who are really conscious about 
their, their breed being you know, safe and when they're moving them around, they're willing to spend enormous amount of money for a, a test that could be fast and they wouldn't be affected by it. So it really depends on who's willing to pay that amount of money and how important it is for them. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, and uh, maybe that's your first entry point. Uh, maybe that when the bar barriers are low or the price is not such an important uh, uh, consideration in that vertical, maybe that's your first point of entry. Um, and then, of course, the, the difficulties of targeting government versus private sector. You know, um, there's always a longer life cycle uh, for selling into the government versus private sector, but um, there could be an advantage of being the first customer with the government once you've proved yourself the continual repeat business that you might get with the government might be an attractive uh, um, proposition than the private sector. Um, and um, understand the verticals that your um, competitors are in. Perhaps the, the, the verticals that they are not in are the entry points for yourself as well. Um, I also wanted to, uh, to reiterate at this point that when you are thinking about the industry that you're going, trying to get into, you want to think about the type of investment that's going on. So everybody, I mean, I, myself included, uh, have seen this change shift after 9-11. Um, I know there were water treatment companies, technology testing companies that I had worked with, uh, one particular one called Hawk that uh, changed this entire company product name to water security technologies. It was the exact same products, they just rebranded themselves. Um, just to, you know, with the flow of the industry, what's happening in that space. Um, so there's a lot of security technologies, there were, there were investment happening in that space, so there were a lot of companies we saw uh, that were dedicated to, you know, anything from anthrax testing in the, you know, envelope to, you know, water testing, you name it. There were a lot of technologies that came uh, from, that, from that investment. Similarly in clean tech, I think, um, I think I see some uh, audience here from the clean tech space, gentlemen over here, I think. Um, and with the Green Energy Act and the FIT program, obviously we're seeing a lot of investment from outside um, the community. So there is an opportunity for entrepreneurs to participate in this uh, in some way and take advantage of the investment that's happening. Uh, similarly in China, there's a huge amount of investment happening in, in the clean tech space. So depending on where the, the need is, maybe your product could be rebranded to match the industry that you're in and can be very powerful in uh, making that sale. Um, ultimately, so we've gone through a whole host of things. I know it was very long, you look tired. <laughs> you, know, you thought about the competing technologies, how big your market is, where you're going to sell, who you're going to sell it to, all of that. It's a lot of information, a lot of things to consider when you are trying to build a business. But ultimately, the question that you have to ask is, what's my value proposition? Um, I just love this shoe, which is so interesting. Uh, somebody decided, you know, I, I can't be bothered carrying a boom box. I want to play something on my shoe. So obviously, we don't see that around uh, much. <laughs> Um, so whether your answer is a go or no go, you know, you're making a decision. I, should I decide to go down this path or not? I think you, you have got to know your market, your customers, your industry dynamics uh, really well before you, you know, get to yourself and I'm ready to go for this kind of decision. Um, so I think that's key. I want to leave you with a few tips, which you probably are already doing uh, as some members in this industry. Um, it is a race almost <laughs> in, some, in some industries. Um, ICT for sure, I think. Um, are you on top of your industry? So you are, you know, in some industries, you've got to show up in the trade shows every year. You have to spend that $2,000 to have that booth or you're going to be forgotten. So you just, you just have to spend that money for certain industries. Maybe not in all cases. Um, you know, I'm sure you're subscribing to all the, the newsletters and journals. Uh, maybe consider even writing for some of them. You know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, you, you get your voice out there. You might be, you know, considered, uh, uh, you know, an expert in a particular area. Get your voice out there to write uh, articles if you like. Um, the other powerful tool I think uh, would be helpful for you is each of those uh, market research firms who where analysts are covering different segments um, 
are talking to your competitors, your competitors' competitors, large, small, medium companies all the time. They're, to they're in the top of the game. They have more hours in the day to do that than you and I, and that's their job, basically. So tracking them is, can be very helpful. You know, what are they publishing? What blogs are they writing? Where are they presenting? Uh, can be re really power powerful to get to know about uh, what's happening in their industry. Um, and don't stalk them. The last but not least is exploring um, vendor briefings. Um, so if you are a, if you, if you have a, you know, a maybe 500K in the bank, you are doing well, um, but you want to get to the next level, you want to be a $2 million, $3 million company, um, you've filed your patents, you're good to go, you have your website, et cetera, you are ready to present yourself to the outside world in a confident manner. Consider vendor briefings. These are free of charge. Any market research firm is open to listening to entrepreneurs talk about their company. Um, they because they imbibe and learn from what they are listening outside of them, you know, and they write about entrepreneurs or new technologies coming out. So be be careful that you don't uh, share too much proprietary things. You know, have a presentation in place. Uh, be uh, respectful of their time, do a short, you know, 40 minute presentation, let them ask questions. Um, and that way you're getting your name out there in, uh, in front of these analysts who might be writing a research paper in that topic and might consider writing about you. Always a request to have uh, the profile that you've, they've written about you to, you know, um, to have you look at it so that, you know, you're not misrepresented. Um, and then send them news releases or press releases from time to time just to keep yourself top of mind uh, in the company so that, um, you know, they might like, ah, I remember that company X, those guys were cool. Um, and they might want to contact you again to see what happened. Um, you know, there are, there are certain companies that even uh, provide best practices awards. Uh, that can be a really nice um, way of marketing your company. So there are various options and we definitely have pointers or the do's and don'ts about these kinds of things. So feel free to tap into our capabilities. Um, as Carrie said, my group and I, and I think two of them are here. Guys, put your hands up. Yeah, two of them are here. The other were shy <laughs> or didn't think that they need to be here. <laughs> One of the two. Um, uh, the Mars Market Intelligence Services is just one of the services that are provided to Ontario entrepreneurs as advisory services, educational content on our website, um, and also seed money that, uh, that is provided to entrepreneurs in a you know, in different staged pro process. But a lot of this is, uh, um, all of it, the first three at least, are all free services that you can tap into. And we ha will be happy to speak to you about those. Um, just a, a quick note on the eligibility criteria. Because we work with so many vendors, about 20 different vendors, we have to be strict about um, uh, the revenue criteria of entrepreneurs. We can't work with anyone who have more than a million in revenues or more than two million in investment. I think uh, most of the people we work with are pre-revenue, so we don't have that difficulty. Um, I also work with professor entrepreneurs and student entrepreneurs um, in Ontario, and, and they have to be in Ontario. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, we found that most people that we work with have found it to be a very valuable resource. Uh, we've had more than 1,000 requests this past year and worked with 800 entrepreneurs or so, and, um, and found it be, they found it to be very helpful at various stages of the company growth. Um, as you can see, the kind of companies we worked with, a lot of ICT, um, information communication technology, and life sciences, and, uh, and increasingly more clean tech uh, companies. Um, these are just different organizations that we work with. So we're at, located in Toronto, but we actually serve all of Ontario um, to our other offices, uh, other commercialization offices. Um, and these are some of the databases that we have access to that uh, you may or may, may not recognize. Uh, we've um, put together a list of the top uh, vendors at different spaces that people recognize in ICT, in you know, Gartner, Forrester, IDC kind of things, and uh, in, in healthcare, a whole host of things in healthcare and other industries that we tap into, and apart from uh, public domain resources and also University of Toronto resources. 
And uh, this is my team. Um, as you can see, they, they all have technical backgrounds, business backgrounds, um, information specialists. So we tap into each other's uh, strengths. Um, I'm also the, the clean tech analyst, um, and I can be. I don't think Jessica is here today. Um, and we have a small team, but we're efficient. <laughs> and we help a, a lot of entrepreneurs. Thank you for your time. <laughs>